Welcome to the Echo of God, True Devotion to Jesus Through Mary. I'm Father Lance Harlow, and in this DVD series, we're studying St. Louis de Montfort's book, A True Devotion to Mary. And the DVD series is based upon the book I wrote, The Echo of God. And if you have this book uh, for the DVD series, it would be very helpful to follow along with. I'm not, uh, on the TV show, I'm not saying everything that's in the book. So if you have it, it'd be very helpful. If you don't have the book, you can still follow along uh, just by listening to the program and then perhaps getting the book, The Echo of God, in order to supplement what we don't have. In our previous program, we discussed the, the interior and exterior practices of true devotion to Jesus through Mary. And as you recall, there are many recommendations that St. Louis presents uh, for the interior cultivation of virtue, but also the exterior practices which reinforce those interior uh, devotions and practices. Now these are exterior practices are aimed at reinforcing that interior. Interior means you don't say it out loud. These are prayers that you would say in your head, private practices. The exterior practices were those practices that you would do publicly in church or with other people. And you remember I said in that program, there's a long list of these practices. Don't worry about trying to do every single one of them. These are examples for you, examples for you to try to uh, cultivate your spiritual life and your devotional life. If you try to do everything in those categories, if you tend to be very perfect perfectionistic and you want to do everything well, it's going to be overwhelming. So the goal is really then to pick and choose that which you can do well for, and what's, what suits your personality also. In today's program, we're going to begin the section called Perfect Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. In the section of St. Louis' book, he builds his case for the true devotion, which is the best of all the other devotions to Mary. And so let's begin then with what he calls Article 1, a perfect and entire consecration of oneself to the Blessed Virgin. So if you're following in the textbook, we're going to go right to paragraph 120. St. Louis says this, All our perfection consists in being conformed, united, and consecrated to Jesus Christ. And therefore the most perfect of all devotions is, without any doubt, that which the most perfectly conforms, unites, and consecrates us to Jesus Christ. Now Mary, being the most conformed of all creatures to Jesus Christ, it, it follows that of all devotions, that which most consecrates and conforms the soul to our Lord is devotion to His Holy Mother, and that the more a soul is consecrated to Mary, the more it is consecrated to Jesus. Hence, it comes to pass that the most perfect consecration to Jesus Christ is nothing else but a perfect and entire consecration of ourselves to the Blessed Virgin. And this is the devotion which I teach, or in other words, a perfect renewal of the vows and promises of holy baptism. And so in this paragraph, uh, one should especially notice that St. Louis states, the more a soul is consecrated to Mary, the more it is consecrated to Jesus. That's the key theological underpinning for his entire treatise, is that the more you give yourself to Our Lady, the more she gives us over to Jesus. And so any authentic Marian devotion is consecrated, uh, where one consecrates oneself to Mary, one ends up being more consecrated to Jesus, so that Jesus uh, is the end goal of our consecration. So theocentric is a Christocentric consecration and devotion, meaning Jesus is the goal. It's always the case, and I've I have reinforced that before. And so uh, St. Louis will say, we're the most conformed to Christ then by baptism. And this, this uh, devotion to Our Lady is really the perfect renewal of our baptismal promises. And we're going to see that in a minute. But St. Louis ties this in with the sacrament of baptism. Now in paragraph 121, St. Louis enumerates the ways we consecrate ourselves to Mary. The me this, these means will form the heart of the consecration prayer. And so let us just take a look at it then. This is paragraph number 121. It's called, A Perfect and Entire Consecration of Oneself to the Blessed Virgin. This devotion consists then in giving ourselves entirely to Our Lady in order to belong entirely to Jesus through her. We must give her, one, our body with all its senses and members, two, our soul with all its powers, three, our exterior goods of fortune, whether present or to come, four, our interior and spiritual goods, which are our merits and our virtues, and our good works, past, present, and future. In a word, we must give her all we have in the order of nature and in the order of grace, 
and all that may become ours in the future in the orders of nature, grace, and glory. And we must do that without reserve. So this is the key to the consecration, handing over to Our Lady all of these things, both spiritual and material. Now, in paragraph 122, and I'm not going to speak a lot about that. That's something you should read on your own because I could spend a whole program just speaking about uh, meritorious, val uh, uh, meritorious uh, ver uh, value and satisfactory value. And so in this paragraph, and it's very theological, and it's a little bit tricky, but it's well defined in the text. You can read the definitions yourself. But in this paragraph, St. Louis speaks about satisfactory and meritorious value to our actions. And it's well worth reading the commentary, but we're going to skip it for now. And we're going to go to paragraph 123. In 123, St. Louis states this. He's making uh, some several conclusions now based on the preceding uh, enumeration of this consecration to Mary. So this is a sub-paragraph. He says, By this devotion we give to Jesus Christ in the most perfect manner, inasmuch as it is by Mary's hands, all we can give him, and far more than by any other devotions in which we give him, either a part of our time, or part of our good works, or part of our satisfactions and mortifications. So St. Louis is saying his consecration is the best because we don't just give her part of ourselves, we give her all of ourselves. And in fact, this consecration surpasses even the vows that religious take, nuns, religious priests, and monks, and that they don't make this wholehearted consecration to Our Lady. So he's saying, he's pointing out, this is why my consecration is the best. In paragraph number 124, he says, a person who is thus voluntarily consecrated and sacrificed to Jesus Christ through Mary can no longer dispose of the value of any of his good actions. All he suffers, all he thinks, all the good he says or does belongs to Mary, in order that she may dispose of it according to the will of her Son and of his greatest glory. And so this, cons this consecration, while it's all-encompassing, doesn't inf interfere with our own duties and state of life. And so, for example, if you are married, if you are a, 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 a priest, if you have holy orders, it doesn't interfere with your praying for people that you have a duty to pray for. Just we give, because we give to Mary all of the effects of our prayers and the, the good merits of our prayers doesn't mean we stop praying because we say Mary's going to pray for us. No, we continue in our own state in life, and that's important. Many people get confused with that point, and I get lots of questions for them. If they say, if I give to Mary all the results of my prayers, all the end of my prayers, saying, Blessed Mother, take care of this. Does that mean I can no longer pray for my family? No, that's not at all what St. Louis is saying. He's saying, don't worry about how things turn out. Place of the Mary's Immaculate Heart, let her worry about how things will turn out. Because St. Louis will say, she knows the best outcome for our intentions. Now we go to paragraph 125, where St. Louis says, still talking about the consecration, we consecrate ourselves at one and the same time to the Most Holy Virgin and to Jesus Christ, to the Most Holy Virgin as the perfect means by which Jesus Christ has chosen, whereby to unite himself to us and us to him, and to our Lord as to our last end, to whom as our Redeemer and our God we owe all we are. And so St. Louis here is reiterating the Christocentric motivation for our consecration. We give everything over to Mary in order to give everything over to Jesus. Now, St. Louis keeps repeating this point because, you know, during his lifetime, in his own time, people were very critical of him. There were those proud scholars that he spoke about in the last program who were criticizing him and saying, you give too much emphasis to Mary, you're neglecting Jesus. He says, no, you don't understand me. It's just the opposite. The more attention you give to Mary, the more she gives it over to Jesus, the more directly we go there. So if it sounds a little bit repetitive, it's because he's, he's defending himself and he's defending his theological position and his pietistic tr uh, position that as a form of prayer and spirituality, it really works because it makes good theological sense. Now we come to the section of the book called Article 2, A Perfect Renewal of the Vows of Holy Baptism. In this section, St. Louis delineates more precisely the relationship between true devotion and baptism. So that's going to be the key. If you're following along in the book now, we're on paragraph 126, and it's called Article 2, A Perfect Renewal of the Vows of Holy Baptism. And I'm just going to read a few sentences from that paragraph. You can read the rest on your own. I have said that this devotion may rightly be called a perfect renewal of the vows or promises of holy baptism. For every Christian before his baptism was the slave of the devil, seeing that he belonged to him. 
He has in his baptism, by his own mouth or by his sponsors, solemnly renounced Satan, his pomps and his works, and he has taken Jesus Christ for his master and sovereign Lord, to depend upon him in the quality of a slave of love. St. Louis is a very dramatic writer. Of course, he's speaking about this idea of belonging to the devil simply means once in a state of original sin. And so by baptism, then, original sin is removed. Grace comes into the life of the one who's baptized. One enters into the kingdom of God. And so that's the distinction he's making. But I want to say a few words about uh, this comparison between true devotion and baptism. And so you can follow along the books in the, in the book in the commentary section or just watch on the screen as we outline these two things. So St. Louis saying, true devotion is the perfect renewal of the baptismal promises, and this is why. In the true devotion, we renounce the devil, the world, sin, and the self. In baptism, we renounce Satan, his works, and all his empty promises. In true devotion, we give ourselves to Jesus by Mary. In baptism, we proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. In true devotion, we give ourselves by our own free will. In baptism, we become slaves of love to Jesus, meaning we are to totally dependent upon Him for grace. In true devotion, we give to Jesus the value of all our good actions. And in baptism, we are given to Jesus by parents and godparents who make an active faith for us. So St. Louis is saying this parallels the true devotion, the consecration of oneself to Jesus through Mary, it parallels exactly everything that has taken place in baptism. It's not in conflict, it's not in contradiction with it. It is the fulfillment of the baptismal promises. Let us go on now to paragraph 131. And in this paragraph, St. Louis is in the section called Objections and Answers. So some people, he can sense some people are having some qualms about this, and so he anticipates their questions and their objections. And so he'll say in paragraph 131, no one can object to this devotion as being either a new or an indifferent one. And so St. Louis will speak about uh, different councils of the church, different church fathers who have supported the idea of renewing one's baptismal promises. Now for us in the 21st century, it's, it's uh, not a big deal because we do this now. But be, in St. Louis' time in the late 17th, early 18th century, they didn't renew their baptismal promises annually. We do that now at the Easter Vigil. And that happened as a result of the Second Vatican Council. But before that, they didn't do it. So it was sort of a private enterprise of renewing one's baptismal promises. So that's why St. Louis is saying, um, the, he's, he's saying that this doesn't contradict with baptism, this supports it. But even for us though, if people skip out and don't go to the Easter Vigil Mass or to the Easter Sunday Mass, if they skip out on that and they don't renew their baptismal promises, this would be a means for them to be able to do that. St. Louis now says in paragraph 132, he's speaking about these objections and answers still. And I just want to say a, a few words about that. St. Louis says, the people are objecting, saying, well, if I give all the credit of my prayers to Our Lady, wouldn't I be neglecting my friends that I promised to pray for? St. Louis says, no. Mary knows what your friends need. She will take good care of them. She knows what they need even better than you do. Another objection is, well, what about praying for the dead, the souls in purgatory? If I give to Our Lady all the merits of my prayers for them, that I pray for my dead relatives or dead friends, uh, won't that be I'm neglecting my dead relatives? St. Louis says, no. Our Lady, who's in heaven, knows what these souls need even more than you know what they need. So you're not neglecting the souls of the living or the souls of the dead by any means. In fact, because Our Lady knows exactly what they need, she'll take even better care of them than you will. Now we move to the section called Chapter 2, Motives of this Perfect Consecration. And this is the longest part of the book. It's the longest part of the True Devotion to Mary book. Because here St. Louis presents eight motives for why we should make this perfect consecration to Jesus through Mary. And so I'm going to read through these eight motives. We'll list them for you. Um, but if you have the book, follow along, and I'll try to indicate the paragraph numbers that go with it. This is my favorite section of the book, to tell you the truth, because it speaks about why we should consecrate ourselves to Jesus through Mary, why we should do it. And then later in the program, we're going to see this, the effects of doing that. So these are the motives, the reasons why we should give ourselves over to Mary. The, uh, so paragraph 135, St. Louis says, The first motive which shows, shows us the excellence of this consecration of ourselves to Jesus Christ by the hands of Mary. If we can conceive on earth no employment more lofty than the service of God, if the least servant of God is richer, 
more powerful and more noble than all the kings and emperors of this earth, unless they also are the servants of God, what must be the riches, the power, and the dignity of the faithful and perfect servant of God, who is devoted to his service entirely and without reserve to the utmost extent possible? This long introduction, St. Louis says, there's nothing greater on earth than to serve God. There's no greater dignity to the soul than to give ourselves over to the loving service of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Doesn't mean you have to be a priest or a nun to do that. All the baptized can do that. We give our lives over to the Father. St. Louis says, when we do the consecration, Mary's going to show us in an even greater way how to give ourselves over to the service of God, because that's what she did in her life. And she will help us to do that. She'll help us to, to perform the most perfect vocational aspect to love, the, love God, to love the Father. The second motive, this is in paragraph 139. The second motive which shows us how just it is in itself and how advantageous to Christians to consecrate themselves entirely to the Blessed Virgin by this practice in order to belong more perfectly to Jesus Christ. The good master did not disdain to shut himself up in the womb of the Blessed Virgin as a captive and as a loving slave, and later to be just subject and obedient to her for thirty years. He gave more glory to God as Father during all that time of submission to and dependence on our Blessed Lady than he would have given him if he had employed those thirty years in working miracles and preaching to the whole world and in converting all men. So St. Louis says that we imitate the humility of Jesus when we give ourselves over to Our Lady, because Jesus spent nine months in Mary's womb and 30 years living in Mary's house at home before He began His three years of public ministry. So the second motive is, when we give ourselves over to uh, Our Lady, she raises us in humility and obedience, just as Jesus was raised in, hum in humility and in obedience as well. Let's move on to the third motive. If you can keep up with me, we're going to paragraph 144. The third motive says, it obtains for us the good offices of the Blessed Virgin. This means that Mary gives herself to her slave of love. Now, we talked about that holy slavery before. It doesn't mean subjugation of one human being to another human being. It means a total dependence upon another. So the third motive is, when we give ourselves over to Our Lady, being totally dependent upon her, she also, in the exchange of love, gives herself over to us completely. And so, uh, 144 will say this, The Most Holy Virgin, who is a mother of sweetness and mercy, and who, le who never lets herself be outdone in love and liberality, seeing that we give ourselves entirely to her, to honor and to serve her, and for that end strip ourselves of all that is dearest to us in order to adorn her, meets us in the same spirit. Now, St. Louis will go on to say that she adorns us with her own merits. She gives us her graces. And as you can see, that exchange is quite unbalanced. We have very little to give her. She has everything to give us, the fullness of grace. And so therefore, the third motive for us to consecrate ourselves to her is that she gives herself completely to us. The fourth motive now is found in paragraph 151. This paragraph is called, It, it is an excellent means of procuring God's greater glory. And so St. Louis says, this devotion faithfully practiced is an excellent means of making sure that the value of all our good works shall be employed for the greater glory of God. Scarcely anyone acts for that noble end, although we are under the obligation to do so. And so St. Louis says, if you consecrate yourself to, uh, uh, to Mary, she will obtain graces for you to do things for God greater's glory, God's greater glory. Because we don't know what God's greater glory is. What is more pleasing to God? What is the most pleasing thing to God? St. Louis says, Mary knows and she'll help you. Because she who has such an intimate relationship with God the Father knows what procures His greatest glory. So if you want to do your very best, if you want to be an A-plus devotee to Jesus through Mary, he said, consecrate yourself to her. She'll obtain for you those extraordinary graces. The fifth motive, why we should give ourselves to Jesus through Mary, St. Louis says, it leads us to union with our Lord. So we're in paragraph 152, and if you follow along in this paragraph, you'll see St. Louis breaks it down into several sections, and he calls them ways. He calls them four ways, four ways by which we're able to uh, give ourselves over to, our lady, to a greater union to Jesus. And I'll just list those four ways to you. They're very simple and they're very beautiful. First is an easy way. Second is a short way. Thirdly, is a perfect way. And fourthly, is a secure way. 
St. Louis will develop how these different ways or paths are uh, in imitation of how Jesus lived his own life, and they get us to Our Lady and get us to Our Lady and get us to Jesus directly. In other words, you can easily be strayed, be uh, distracted in life, you can stray from the right path, but St. Louis says, if you go directly to Jesus uh, through Mary, she's not going to lead you astray, and she's not going to lead you down into some kind of cultish practice or something that would be uh, uh, opposed to our religion. Devotion to Our Lady is something which is always directly leading us to Jesus. And so if you have the text, read through those short ways. It's very beautiful and it's very poignant. And it speaks about how there's great security in following Our Lady. The, the path to Our Lady uh, is uh, a sure path. The path to Jesus through Mary is a direct path. There's no deviation from it. And so it's very beautiful. Take a look at that and see uh, how you can uh, meditate upon that and grow in your own spiritual life and understanding by that. I want to move on to the sixth motive, because the sixth motive then is an important one. It's, it's St. Louis says, it gives us great interior liberty. And I want to read this for you. M paragraph 169, this practice of devotion gives to those who make use of it faithfully a great interior liberty, which is the liberty of the children of God. Since by this devotion we make ourselves slaves of Jesus Christ and consecrate ourselves entirely to Him in this capacity, our good master in recompense for the long captivity in which we put ourselves takes from the soul all scruple and servile fear which are, in, which are capable only of cramping, imprisoning, or confusing it. And he enlarges the heart with firm confidence in God, making it look upon him as a father, and he inspires us with a tender and filial love. The sixth motive, St. Louis says, for consecrating ourselves to Mary is that it provides us with this love for God, love for God as Father. Now, you know, I meet a lot of people who are afraid of God. They're afraid that He's going to be this, this taskmaster who's going to condemn them to hell for the slightest thing that they did. Sometimes people have a bad relationship with their earthly father, father and they translate that into the relationship with God, the Heavenly Father. St. Louis says, if, when you consecrate yourself to Mary, she'll obtain for you this removal of fear, removal of fear of God as a tyrant. It'll give you a greater love for God as Father. And that's a relationship that we, we acquire by baptism. St. Louis says, by this perfect renewal of the baptismal promises, by true devotion, you'll have a greater love for God as Father. And that's important. And I'm, because as I said, I meet a lot of people who are afraid of God. And there may be some of you watching this program who are afraid of the Father as well. Mary doesn't want you to be afraid of God. God doesn't want you to be afraid of God. But we get this, this idea in our head we misinterpret the scriptures and we see God not as being uh, merciful, loving, and kind, which is how he reveals himself, but we see God as being uh, a very severe judge and a very severe taskmaster. Let us go on to the seventh motive now. We're working our way through these eight motives. We go to the, through the seventh motive, which is called, It Procures Great Blessings for Our Neighbor. And so this is paragraph 171 in the text. I'll read to you uh, just the first part of this, and then you can read the rest on your own. Another consideration which may bring us to embrace this practice is the great good which our neighbor receives from it. For by this practice we exercise charity toward him in an imminent manner, seeing that we give him by Mary's hands all that is most precious to ourselves, namely the satisfactory and perpetuatory value of all our good works, without accepting the least good thought or the least little suffering. And so in this paragraph then, St. Louis says, when we give ourselves over to Our Lady, it procures great blessings for our neighbor. What does that mean? It means if you have people that you're praying for, whether they are friends, neighbors, or family members, by consecrating ourselves to late Our Lady and by giving over the good works that our prayers would bring about, she brings about the greatest result for our friends. Many people pray with such great intensity for something to change or to happen in the lives of their friends, their neighbors, their family, and they become so obsessed by it, it's no longer prayer, it's obsession. It's obsession about what's going to happen to this person and how can I pray hard enough to change God's mind maybe to make something happen differently for this person. And so St. Louis says, when you give yourself over to Our Lady, she's going to take all of your interests, your intentions, all of your intercessions, she's going to take all of your mortifications, all of your sufferings, all that you're doing, and she's going to be able to apply those in the best way for the people for whom you are praying. And so he says, 
this should be motive enough for making this consecration. The fact that Our Lady is going to receive all of these prayers and she's going to uh, apply them according to the Father's will for the best outcome for this person. The eighth motive now we come to is in paragraph 173 and it's called, It is an Admirable Means of Perseverance. And so I'll read to you a little bit. 173. Lastly, that which in some sense most persuasively draws us to this devotion to Our Lady is that it is an admirable means of persevering and being faithful in virtue. Whence comes it that the majority of the conversions of sinners are not durable? Whence comes it that we relapse so easily into sin? Whence comes it that the greater part of the just, instead of advancing from virtue to virtue and acquiring new graces, often lose the little virtue and little grace they have. And so St. Louis says, the eighth reason why we should give ourselves over to Mary by means of this consecration is it allows us to persevere in sanctity, allows us to persevere in holiness. And he poses these, these three questions which I just read from you right at the very beginning. How is it good people don't get holier? Good people don't get better. How is it that we lose the graces that we've acquired how is it we take one step forward and two steps backwards? And St. Louis says it's because we don't persevere in holiness. We become too self-inflated. We think, wow, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty holy. I did this all by myself, not recognizing the fact that we're entirely dependent upon God's grace. And so St. Louis says then, by means of this consecration, when you give yourself over to Our Lady, she's going to help you stay on track to persevere in holiness, to persevere when you no longer feel the spiritual high or the spiritual consolation, to persevere when your prayer life feels a little bit dry and you cry out and say, Lord, God, where are you? I don't feel your presence with me at all. To persevere in those difficult moments, that's really the key and the essence to growing in the spiritual life. And when we do persevere in that respect, then we know that we have made promise in virtue, a promise in grace. Now, in paragraph 176, St. Louis will say, This good mother, out of pure charity, always receives whatever we deposit with her. And what she has once received as depositary, she is obliged in justice by virtue of the contract of trusteeship to keep it safe for us. Just as a person with whom I have left a thousand dollars in trust would be under the obligation of keeping them safe for me. So St. Louis is saying, Invest your virtues in Our Lady. She's the safety deposit box, so to speak. By means of the consecration, St. Louis says we give over to her all of our good works. Where will they go? Well, they'll go to her. We call her Immaculate Heart. They go to Our Lady. She, who is capable of preserving grace, will be able to keep those graces safe for us. She's the great depository, the great safety deposit box, we would say today, the great investment. And she never goes bankrupt. And so should we give her all of our merits, our good works, our actions? She will take them and she will guard them. And so one can rightly pray and say, Dear Blessed Mother, I entrust you by means of my consecration. Now that's the, the whole point. We consecrate ourselves to her. I consecrate to you by means of my consecration. I give to you all the good works that I'll do today. Keep them for me because I'm liable of ruining them, being left all, all by myself and being left on my own. And so I know we've gone kind of quickly through these motives. Read them on your own and review them through the textbook and begin to get yourself excited about making this true devotion to Jesus through Mary. Please join me in our next program as we will take a look at the seven effects of the true devotion. And until we meet again then, may Our Lady look over you, protect you, and call you to herself. And may Almighty God bless you and protect you from every evil, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>